Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here every Thursday talking about Gig Performer, talking about live performance mindsets and just kind of gathering together uh, as a community to connect and yeah, focus on important things like music. Um, if you are here, let us know in the chat that you are here and just out of curiosity, question of the day for those of you who are watching, what's your favorite keyboard controller? And if you're not a keyboard player, what's your favorite controller controller? Um, let us know as you are popping in. Um, welcome, Shamas. So happy to see you. Welcome, Thomas Bishop. Um, getting to attend in real time today. Um, great news. Very excited about that. Friends, today is a very exciting day because we actually have special guest Andy Burton with us. Um, he's played on a lot of really cool musical projects, which I'm going to let him tell you um, more about that. Next week, we have a totally different genre of music coming on. Uh, we have gig performer user uh, Kevin Frazier, who is doing generative music. If you haven't checked that out, I'll make sure we'll leave a link in the description for you to see exactly what that is. But he's actually created a scenario in which gig performer plays itself, <laughs> which is kind of a cool, kind of a cool thing. Um, we've got some answers coming in here. Glenn says Nectar Pacer is my favorite. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have an answer, feel free to pop that in. Um, but Without further ado, oh, we've got another one. Let's see here. Currently, Studio Logic SL88, fantastic piano action. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about that controller. Um, we're gonna welcome on Andy. Uh, as these answers come in, we may pause um, and take them, uh, but Andy's gonna share all sorts of really cool things about his life and his process, and uh, it's gonna be great. All right, a special welcome to Andy. How's it going? All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody in gig performer land. Yes. Yes. Thanks so much for being with us, Andy. I, I actually, you were like a, a super early gig performer adopter, right? Were you like version one? No, I was three. You were version three. Okay. Yeah, not so Sweet. early. Sweet. Uh, um, so for those of us who like are watching right now and maybe don't know like the full extent of who you are and what you do, can you give us like a brief <laughs> overview of your life and career and all that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, where to begin? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sure, I feel you. A lot of touring stuff. Um, okay, a yeah. lot of TV stuff, uh, you know, in terms of like, uh, people you would have heard of that I've toured with. Uh, I toured with Rufus Wainwright. I did a world tour with him as part of his band. Uh, John Mayer for two years. Um, Cindy Lauper, um and uh little steven and the disciples of soul steve van zandt from the e street band his 15 piece band that was a three-year journey uh and i'm back with cindy again now awesome and we just finished a bunch of production rehearsals um which is a lot of fun and we're you know we're doing a lot of one-offs right now but we're we're talking about doing some real touring again in 23 like some you know extensive touring so we'll, we'll see we'll see how that all develops um but yeah, uh, so I've been, a, a, as far as my gig performer use, I found out about it, I want to say 2018, 19, that thereabouts. Uh, and I used it on the final leg of the Steven Van Zandt, of the little Steven tour, um, where I I did all kinds of crazy stuff with it. But nothing as crazy as some of the people, I mean, some of the incredibly creative stuff. I, I made no generative music. <laughs> I played... <laughs> I mean, it's almost like doing a Broadway show with yeah. Steven. Um, yeah. It's a 15 piece band. There's not a whole lot of free form improvisation uh, with that. We had a five piece horn section, three backing singers, uh, the second keyboard player. We Our arrangements were pretty well worked out. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I did a video on that, which you can all find on YouTube of me describing my, you know, my wonderful rig that I had for that for that mm -hmm. tour. Um, it's a lot simpler now for yeah. the most part at the moment. Anyway, um, I started using gig performer again. Uh, when I, I got, I got a gig with Adina Menzel, uh, the Broadway Disney star. Um, so far it's just been a one-off gig. Um, but, uh, for that, it was basically again, like learning, learning, learning a Broadway show, a lot of cues, a lot of complicated stuff. Um, 
and uh, Clifford Carter is her music director, and he mostly plays acoustic piano, a little bit of synth, but mostly acoustic piano, and I handle most of everything else that comes from a keyboard. Mm. So that's where I, I dove into version four. Yeah. Because it was, you know, it had been three years since I had used Gig Performer, and I came back into it with a vengeance. Mm-hmm. And uh, a crash course <laughs> in version four, a lot of help from David Jameson on yeah. that, um, who was, you know, I, I don't think I could have done it without without his hand holding. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. But yeah, it, it was a lot of fun and it worked flawlessly. Yeah. Where I couldn't be happier with with how it came out uh, with yeah. my rig. So so yeah. you're you're a keyboard player, but you're also an organist. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a keyboard player. I, you know, like I say you I, I grew up with yeah. classical piano. Okay. I, you know, I still consider myself a pianist. Okay. Uh, I am also a, a you know, you can see the B three right there behind yep, yep. me over there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still in my studio. <laughs> yeah. I do a lot of session work out of this studio here. This is called Tannery Row Recording. You can't see it. I'll just tilt my laptop a little bit so you can see. There's the B three and everything, and there's like a wall of synths over here. Nice, nice. A whole bunch of synths that you can't see. Um, so I do a lot of keyboard overdubs. I do some soundtrack work. I've done a bunch of stuff for TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, recently I've done some work on American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. I've done some stuff for a lot of stuff for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, mm-hmm. uh, the Gilded Age for HBO, mm-hmm. um, and a few other a few other things. But but uh, a lot of cues that I've that I've done right here in this studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessarily gig performer related, but that's yeah. stuff that I've been. That's other stuff I've been up to, yeah. in between the touring and the you know. Basically, it's you know there hasn't been any real touring. I like I said a lot of one off gigs, and I've, I'm very busy right now. But it's I'm not going away for four weeks at a time with any one artist at the right. moment. Um, but that being said, uh, I think it's been you know like as I said, gig performer really worked out great for this mm-hmm. Adina Menzel thing. And I may yet integrate it into my Cindy Lauper mm-hmm. setup, which is basically just a Nord stage three right now. Um, keeping it simple. Yeah. Uh, so what did you, how did you end up needing gig performer? Was like something on the little Steven tour happening that you were like, what I'm doing is not working that caused you to look for gig performer. Like what was the point of friction that made you look for something? The point of friction was, uh, Basically, the more stuff, the more he asked me to do, um, <laughs> the more I started realizing that, you know, just um, triggering a few string sounds and things like that from my laptop using whatever, you know, I could even make it work using logic, you know, sure. like just for one thing or two things. But I started to realize I needed to get deeper in. And I don't want to knock the other fellow's product, but there's a certain product by Apple. <laughs> that I've tried using and I never really gelled with it. Yeah. And um, so when I found out about gig performer, I checked it out. I can't remember how exactly I found out about it. I think I read about it online somewhere. Anyway, I checked it out. Demo copy really liked it. And then, you know, got in touch with David and, mm-hmm. uh, and I was off and running. Yeah. And I, it just felt so, so intuitive. You know, once I, once I basically grasped the format, you know, the wiring and all that stuff, it was, it was, was really nice. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. And Steven is a really interesting cat. I love the guy. Um, he does everything. He, I don't know if anybody else in the music industry works like him, mm-hmm. but this was uniquely suited not that he would know a thing about it. He doesn't know a thing about what happens on a computer screen with me or whatever. But yeah, whenever he made a change to an arrangement, it was always to add something. <laughs> that's just the, he's he's a maximalist, and it sounds yeah. amazing. It was a huge sound we achieved on stage. Fifteen piece band. Wow, could not travel without five horn players. Yeah, and he would have everybody in rehearsal. He would tell every horn player what to play. You play this note. He would play it on the guitar. He had it all in his head. Wow. And and so it was like he would tell the background vocalists what to sing. Everybody in the room at once. No sectional rehearsals. No, like the bassists and drummers are going to meet and we're going to get all the grooves together and then we'll get the full band. It was everybody there all the time. 
he would have an idea and he would execute it right then and there. Wow. And so you, wait, this is everything in me right now is feeling minorly horrified and extremely curious. Yeah. So were, were people just like feverishly taking notes? Yeah. Like, okay, great. That's the answer. The hor the lead Ed Mannion, who was the leader of the horn section, would be there standing with his baritone sax in one hand and his laptop in the other hand, literally <laughs> writing in Sibelius as he's telling everybody what notes to play. He's writing it standing up, you know, wow. with his laptop, you know, taking notes, literally note notes. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. but for me, it was like, okay, Andy, add this, add that. All right. I had to do it quickly. Well, I had so to what do you, how do you even possibly do that quickly? Like, what is your process? So he says, mm -hmm. Andy, you have to add this. Were you already with Gig Performer at that point? Were you yeah. building? You were. Well, I had to be up and running with it. Yeah. Okay. But I would have, I, you know, I tend to, after a while, I kind of got to know him and I got to know what he tended to ask me for. Sure. And I kind of like, there's a better than 50% chant, whatever string line I'm playing. I got to realize there's a better than 50% chance that he's going to ask me to double that with glockenspiel. Okay. So I have my glockenspiel samples ready. Yeah. And I can pretty much click one thing, click one rack space, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, or just ch put this program change in on the Nord and I know I'm going to get this rack space and that's going to give me my glocks. Yeah. So I could do that in a heartbeat. Yep. And when he said to me, do something, I want it to sound like the Beach Boys version of Sloop John B. <laughs> okay. Now, I happen to know the intro to that Yeah, is a, a glockenspiel with flutes. Yes. So I had my flutes and glockenspiels at the ready, yeah. you know, and he liked Mellotron flutes. So I had a really nice Mellotron flute sample. And I also yeah. had some legit flute sample. I had all that stuff just waiting to be deployed. Yeah. And so, so I became the guy that could get the part together in five seconds, you know, that I got that reputation. And then he pushed that reputation to the max. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was really like I had to have strong coffee every morning. Just I needed to be on my toes, you know. Right. He moved fast. Yeah. Well, was, I guess you have to with a band that fast. I'm like, I have so many yeah. questions, Andy. OK, so. so well, we so, got what, an hour, 90 minutes? We, do. To go we, got, <laughs> we got time. But OK, so you're you're working with him. He's throwing stuff at you. Yeah. So I guess what I'm hearing is like half of this game is actually how you're you're predicting what you think he's going to do. So like you're like it seems like you're kind of like you're playing this like emotional relational game that's happening before there's the musical game to be played. It's like, it seems like that's p part of the reason Now, obviously you need gear to sustain it. But part of the reason it seems like you were able to stay with him in that type of a process was actually not musical. It was like a, a personal emotional thing that you have, I guess perhaps developed from working a lot. Is, would you say that's true? Uh, yeah, some degree. I mean, that's part of chops. I, that's like, part of what you have to learn how to do in addition to learning how to play the notes. Yeah. You yeah. have to learn how to respond to what the, the boss wants. Yeah. I mean, certainly it wasn't qu qualitatively different with John Mayer. Mm -hmm. um, he had a light he has a lightning quick mind. Mm -hmm. And, and when he wants to hear something, he, you know, you have to kind of get his references. He'll, you know, he like, he'll say, give me this, uh, something that sounds like, you know, like Bill Evans on kind of blue. All right. So, I mean, that was just a piano thing, but I, yeah. I or play the intro. All right, Andy, I want you to start this song with a ad lib rubato solo piano section. Before we start the song, I want you to play like Horace silver. <laughs> wow. Okay. Good. No so pressure. I would, so I would do that. I was going, okay, what Horace silver record is he thinking? Of? Uh, right. Uh, you know, do yeah. I know that? Do I know? All right. I'm going to fake it if I don't know it. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anyone that I don't know. Um, no, 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 no. Absolutely. But yeah. that was part of what that was what that gig entailed. And, yeah. you know, and that had the additional pressure of it being improvised in front of 15,000 people. Yeah. Or, the, the you know, that was that was a whole other kind of baptism of fire, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I love that every minute of that gig, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it, everybody's got their own thing. You know, Rufus Wainwright uh, is a composer. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. not just an, uh, a recording artist. I mean, he his stuff is as well thought out as some Verdi operas. He, I mean, he loves Verdi. 
mm-hmm. loves his opera. And there's very specific things that he wants. And I mean, most of that was not on the spot. Most of it was just I had to practice like hell mm-hmm. and get all those sounds. That was before I there was I don't think Gig Performer existed in 2012. Mm-hmm. Guess when we'll find that. out if David pops in. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, well, anyway, I, in any case, it didn't really. exist in my world in 2000. <laughs> I didn't know. I I just had to do it all, you know, myself. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so no matter who the artist is, Cindy is also, um, she wants what she wants, and she they all want it now. Right. You know, they all. It's like this is the time right now. You've you're supposed to be prepared, and you're supposed to have at least tried at least a couple of options mm-hmm. uh, of, of where something could go. Mm-hmm. before you're in the room and under the hot, you know, under the, mm-hmm. in the hot seat. So mm-hmm. you should never be in a situation where you have no, where you feel like you're cornered and you crumble. So mm-hmm. that's the emotional side of it. Yeah. Is yeah. that you need to have something mm-hmm. to go, some at least possible answer to the question of what, it, what you need to do. Give me something like that. You got to have a, a, a library in front of you, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, gig performer, it's kind you know, I mean, you have everything, in mm-hmm. front of you in a way you have every plugin on your computer is yeah. there. So that's great you just have to know it you have to, the, the 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 it doesn't gig performer is great at giving you all those options it doesn't teach you your rig you have to know what you have right and you have to know what will work in a, in a given situation and that takes time like anything that's part of the that's part of uh musicianship 101 yeah you know how to be a side man yeah how to, how to be a side you have to know you have to you have to have some kind of clue <laughs> when, when when you get asked to do something, you have to have a pretty good idea of at least one way of achieving it, yep. possibly two or three ways of achieving it. Yeah. In case, in case option one doesn't work out. Uh, I mean, I'm being very general. Yeah. But I mean, I, we could get into specifics. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I think I, the, the heart of what you're saying is just like you know, be in be intentionally thought out before you get in the room, like and be, be unflappable. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be unflappable. You got to be like, okay, I got that. Yeah, level-headed, unflappable. Just get right to it. So, what was? So, I wanted. I do want to look at gig performer, but I'm hearing this. Like, what did you ever have? Like the worst, like failure rehearsal moment. Like, did, like what was? What was your worst in rehearsal moment where you were like, well, crap? Did you ever have one of those? Did you learn yeah. anything from it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. It doesn't have anything to do with gig performer. That's okay. But, Tell me that. Uh, we'll open Gig Performer here in a second. But, you know, it's like people who use Gig Performer are musicians, right? Like, right. And so I'm going, okay, so, like, what are the things that we can take with us into Gig Performer? And I guess one of those things might be what, what you learned from this uh, <laughs> from this moment. And then we'll, we'll look at your Idina rig and, and go from there. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So in terms of, like, uh, like a bad moment. Um, yeah. Okay, so I had been u- I was already using Gig Performer, I think at this point. I think I was. Um and I was but I was using a lot of virtual analog stuff with with Steven. This is with okay. this is with the the Cycles of Soul. A lot of his 80s output like Sun City uh mm-hmm. and all that uh, was very deeply into digital synths as well as uh you know Oberheim's you know, and, and profit fives. So there's that. I was emulating that stuff, either using the Nord uh, engine or using various soft synths. Um, and I decided, you know, I want to take it to, I had decided this is before this bad moment. Mm-hmm. I had decided I wanted to step up my game mm-hmm. and get a real analog synth as mm-hmm. part of my rig. Yeah. So anyway, I had thought about getting a profit six. And but I was swayed when I went to a music store. I was swayed by the Prophet Rev Two, okay, because it had more voices. It was by Timbrel, and it I pl- I found a nice uh, analog brass sound that I really liked. I thought, oh, this is better. This will give me more voices. I can do two sounds at once. So instead of the Prophet Six, I got the Prophet Rev Two. Okay, wrong keyboard for the gig. Nothing against the Rev Two. Yeah, but it uses DCOs. Okay. And the synths I was emulating use VCOs for the most, at least the analog stuff that he wanted. So I replaced all these sounds that I had been doing using virtual synths uh, with sounds from the Prophet Rev 2. Okay. Mm. And when he heard it, he doesn't know what a DCO is. Yeah. He has never, he doesn't know what a VCO is, DCO. He doesn't know analog. 
he heard it. He's like, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't, this is, I don't know if this is a family audience. <laughs> what the F is that? <laughs> that sounds like video games. Wow. So he knew that that sound, because that's what early Atari video games sound like. There's a, there was one song that has a, a sequencer just holding one note going with an analog synth. Yeah. Probably, a, probably a, an Oberheim OB8 on the record, yeah. I would guess, if I had to guess with a sequencer. Anyway, so I've got this thing going. And yeah, it, you know, I realized real analog doesn't necessarily sound better. Yeah. And so I quickly replaced it with an OB6. Mm -hmm. And, but, but before I did, like he, like he was getting dark. He was like, that sounds like, I this sound cool. I need something that sounds cool. I don't need the video games. You know, you've ever watched The Sopranos, and yes. you've seen you've seen Silvio. He was full Silvio okay. in that moment. And I'm like, oh crap! All right, yeah. I went back to my old sounds, which I had that he never complained about. And he was like, ah, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. And then wow. I brought the OB6 in, and that was the step up because that's VCO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It really does sound more like the old Oberheims. Now I've got an OBX8, which I love. Yeah, which is what I would bring now if I were doing it. But anyway, the point being, in that moment, I thought I was I was too clever by half. I thought I was doing. I, I thought, oh, I'll replace all these sounds. It'll be really cool. He'll love it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out he didn't. Yeah. So some. So I don't know what to take away from that other than I thought I was being smart. I thought I was. I had good intentions. Yeah. I was trying to make it better by using real analog, but I really didn't think about what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, and he was more uh, observant than I would, I would have given him credit for. Interesting. Because he didn't, like I said, he could hear the DCOs. He didn't know what to call them, but he said, no, that's not the sound. You know, mm -hmm. he, he had an exact ear. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was, yeah, you know, well, you had your old sounds. I mean, that's the takeaway, right? right? Well, the, oh, there you go. The <laughs> takeaway is I didn't. I I immediately went back to my old sounds, and he was, it, and I I salvaged the moment. I was like, but I'm never letting that happen again. Yeah, yep. So that was so. Anyway, that's yeah. the best I can answer your question. Ooh, no, it's good. I I appreciate that. I feel like those moments, those are like you know, you walk away from you know a pristine failure. Like we had Matt Vanacoro on a couple episodes ago, yeah. and he was talking about he had um you know, an accidental patch change where I guess he was playing something that was supposed to sound like Moonlight Sonata, but ended up, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing it already. Ended up with uh, dinosaur sounds, which, wow. in, in the, you know, which I guess he recovered from, but this wasn't even rehearsal. This was live. Oh. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and I guess after that, I forget exactly what he implemented, but, um, but yeah, that's a rough, but yeah, you like walk away from these moments where you're, you really like feel the weight of what you're doing and you're like, oh yeah, intentionality matters. Having a backup plan matters. Like knowing oh, yeah. your rig matters, knowing your gear matters, knowing the person that you're working with matters. Like it, it's all, that's right. you know, valuable. It's like the, the musicians are like credited with playing music, but like there's a lot more going on. There's like a, there's another game happening. Um, Absolutely. You know, anyway. So you're doing you just finished the show with Idina Menzel and you're using gig right. performer. We touched on this a little bit. Like you're you're a Nord artist, you're a Hammond artist. Correct. You still use gig performer. Why? Like why do you why do you go that route and you know? Um, well, I felt it was really the absolutely the right thing to use for this mm. Idina thing because mm. there's so because well, there's a lot of strings, a lot of synths, mm -hmm. and um a lot of quick changes and a lot of complex arrangements and mm -hmm. um, layered things or whatever. And mm -hmm. um, it, it was a chance to get the best sounds. I mean, like I said, the Nord could handle a lot, mm -hmm. but it's, it doesn't have the best say sampled strings. If I sure. want a string section, a legit string section, the Nord samples are okay, but definitely not the best thing I can, I could use under the circumstances. So, mm -hmm. um, it was easy enough for me to say, okay, I'm going to bring my laptop and a two channel interface and I'll have my Nord and that'll be the controller. And then I'll have a Hammond for all the B3 stuff. I'll have mm -hmm. the XK, I use an XK5 mm -hmm. and I have a bunch of pedals, a pedal like uh, analog pedals that I use with it to, to, to like, you know, plus a ventilator pedal for Leslie and that. So the, the B3 world is it, that's all controlled by that one thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
pretty much everything. The piano was already taken care of by Clifford, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so basically all the other stuff, synthesizers, strings, orchestral instruments, you know, and other random keyboard things were all handled. I would say 90% of the sounds ended up being gig performer. Wow. Interesting. So, so gig performer really, really came through. Yeah. So it was like gig performer was like the sound upgrade. It was like wherever, yeah. wherever you needed something better than what you had available, you used gig performer to drive it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, should we show gig performer? Should we like jump in and, and kind of see what you're working with here? Sure. Um, <clears throat> It's quite vanilla compared to some of the things I've, uh, yeah, you know, some of the things I've seen, some of these incredible arrangements that people have come up with. But anyway, it is no, what it is. It's it's good. Well, you know, we, we had somebody come on um, earlier who we ended up doing a second release. So if you haven't seen uh, Miko Patama's interview with us, he was no, like, I haven't. yeah. So he he's actually also an organ player, but uh -huh. he was like, gig performer is the is the only thing that I a gig performer is used exclusively to give me the best if i want something that's average and just gets the job done i use hardware when i need the best i use gig performer because i have access to the highest level sounds or like you know the spitfire audio strings that are really great or he has a leslie emulation he uses and he's like you know if i need something that's run of the mill and i'm playing uh you know a wedding gig on a Thursday night for cocktail hour, I'm going to plug in my keyboard and call it an afternoon. But it seems like the connection to here in my mind is that you guys are both kind of choosing your tools based on the context that you need. Right. I mean, and, and like, so for Hammond, I'm using, I'm not only, you know, am I doing what, I, you know, I'm a Hammond artist. And stuff, yeah. So I use, I use that for organ, mm -hmm. yeah. but also I do feel that it is that like the Hammond XK five, through the ventilator, through the specialized pedals, the tall and fat. There's a couple of other pedals. There's, there's a couple of Lounsbury pedals that I use. Mm -hmm. Those pedals are really great, and that I feel that that is the best Hammond sound I could achieve, short of getting a real thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, I use the XK5 with Steven as well with a Leslie, mm -hmm. albeit yeah. with a Leslie. But um, I do feel that that was that. So that's the. I feel like I could get a better sound out of that than mm -hmm. any plug-in. Yeah. Yeah. So, makes sense. Um, but if I didn't have that, I would probably use Gig Performer too because I yeah. feel like that's the best. You know, that's the second best, I think. Yeah. But in terms of all the synth stuff, and st unless I brought some of these beasts with me, mm -hmm. which I wasn't going to do, mm -hmm. then then Gig Performer really is the best of the best. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it makes makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, do you want to share your screen, and we'll kind of check sure. out what you're doing here? Sure. So you were saying this is kind of a little bit like a Broadway show. Did they give you charts or were you like just memorized when you came in? They gave you a set list and you learned the tunes or. Oh, I had charts. OK, awesome. I had charts, but uh, a lot of extensive notes. OK, as sure. well that I had to make. Sure. So I don't know. All can right, you cool. see my screen now? I'm going to put it on. Yep. We can see Gig Performer. All right. So these are uh, I had. the So. I don't know if you can if you see my my list of rack spaces and you can see they're sort of out of order numerically. Yeah. Um, and if I click on any one of like string ensemble, you see all these different patch changes. Mm -hmm. um, this is due to uh, something I ran into, a problem I ran into using the Nord Stage three mm. as a controller. Yeah. So both the Nord Stage three and Gig Performer have. Uh, you know, a way of um, giving you continuity as you change sounds. And on, on Gig Performer, it's patch persist. And on the Nord Stage 3, the same thing. You can you can hold down one sound while you change to another, and it'll keep playing as long as you hold your you know, your finger down on the key. It, yeah. it's, called, it's called uh seamless transitions. Mm. So I have that on both. I have all of these uh, rack spaces have uh, patch persist turned on. And it's necessary for the arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was that uh, when you have the, the Nord as a controller, uh, it has what we call external. It has called there's an external. There's a whole section of the Nord's layout that allows you to do external control, mm -hmm. and you have a program change and a and a channel picked out as well as other parameters you can you can customize um 
And that's what I attempted to do. I attempted to uh, have these songs in a particular order and just be able to shift them around in the Nord as the set list changed. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't able to do that because patch persist or seamless transitions did not exist over MIDI. So when I was holding down a note uh, using one of these uh, external settings on the Nord, if I change patch, it would send a note off Wow! To every note. So I couldn't hold the notes. And I was like, this ain't working. Wow. Okay. So what, what was the solve on that? It was, it took a lot of, of back and forth uh, and, 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 and uh, a lot. It was, a, it was a somewhat frustrating, but ultimately successful uh, video call with David. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And he was a champ. And I love he, it. He helped me through it. <laughs> Basically what it ended up being, the solution was that I can't use the external uh, controls from the Nord. I just have to have the global setting set to, you know, I chose MIDI channel one. So I just have to have everything. Um, basically I just have the Nord just sending out MIDI like a good little, good little keyboard, <laughs> whichever. And, and the program, it'll send out When I select a sound, it will send to that program change. Mm -hmm. And I just have to know what the order is. And if there's any change to the order, then I have to change it in Gig Performer. Gotcha. And so that's that's basically what happened. So you, if you see on the screen here, you see these different song titles, and you see you've got 13 followed by 20, followed by three, followed by 21. Mm -hmm. So all these things were changing. And, and if a song order changed, I just needed a little bit of time to adjust it in in Gig Performer so that uh, so that it would call up the right sound. Wow. So I didn't I wasn't able to customize it and I wasn't able to use some of the features on the Nord Stage 3 mm -hmm. because of this silly thing that really sh they should have figured out. Um but anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. Interesting. Uh I did get it to work and and ultimately, you know, as I say, once I once I figured this little once I got once I realized that I couldn't use all the fancy bells and whistles on the Nord and I just had to use it as a dumb controller, it worked out great. Yeah. So if that, that that's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. I guess it does make a ton of sense. What I'm seeing here is um, uh, you you kind of you're building this backwards from what I've seen everybody else do, which <laughs> I love. I love everything about it. So you're building a patch and then suiting songs into those patches using variations as opposed to building one very or one rack space per song or something like that. Was that, did you do it this way just because that's what made sense to you? Or did you find you were using a lot of repeating patches or how did that end up happening? It, 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 you can see there are six different songs that use string ensemble. Yeah. So I felt like this was the, I felt like it made more sense to do it this way. Yeah. Um. I, I don't know enough about what everybody else is doing. I don't sure. know enough. I'm, I'm an, I'm an, I'm a naive, uh, to the ways of, of what everyone else has been doing for years. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know that David would approve of this, but it, but it <laughs> well, did work. Yeah, well, so, I guess that's the most important part, right? It's like the point of a computer originally, gig performer aside, was to spend less time doing something, right? right. Like that's the whole point. So if you're getting the output that you need, then it, then it did its job. Correct. Yeah. Which I love. And and actually, even more than that, I love how simple everything is. Is this your typical front panel where you have oh, yeah. your volumes and your 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 uh, meters? That's it. Yeah, I love That's it. That's it. I don't and have I don't have my Nord here today. Mm -hmm. Um but so I I'm using a, a Dexabel, which I which actually is a really nice piano controller. But okay. anyway, uh the let me see if this. No, it's not working. The uh, the the expression pedal is not mapping as it would. Okay. But I've got the but this both basically both of these channels. Now what is this? Is the string ensemble? If you look at the wiring, you'll see that I have two instances of contact mm -hmm. as my sound source, and this is basically just both sources. One of them is the contact factory strings, and the other is Spitfire. Okay. So I've got a blend of two different string samples, basically. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and what made you choose those two string sounds other than they sound great? I mean, is the answer that simple? Like, 
you uh, like it yeah, yeah they sound great but but uh yeah i use the contact basically for the attack for when i have to do more marcato strings mm -hmm. yep and i used the spitfire for the body of the sound more gotcha. so you'd hear like i felt like the, the like you have a couple of different articulations to choose from typically the legato let me see if i can go into is this which one is this yeah so this is the spitfire the london contemporary orchestra strings mm -hmm. so i think i've got the marcato selected at the moment okay. but the but the legato setting which is here i felt like it's just a little bit too soft of an attack if i'm doing a 16th note run it's you're just not going to hear anything right so i have the contact set to marcato and that just gives me a little bit more uh -huh. it just gives me a little bit more articulation uh and i was definitely fooling around like you on both of i had this both of them set to you know playing the sort of strings uh, the keyboards at the, the notes at the very bottom of the keyboard yep to change articulation so i was doing a lot of articulation switching on the fly wow so that's that feels to me completely frightening have you just done enough articulation switching on the fly that you're very comfortable with that comfortable enough okay i won't say i'm doing it um I, I, I would say I'm probably doing it maybe half a dozen times or half a dozen to 10 times per song. Okay. Like switching between legato sections, going marcato or even staccato for a couple of passages where I really need the strings to stick out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then I'm also working in the expression pedal to make them louder or what have you. Okay. To get, to get something expressive out of it. And then maybe occasionally going to tremolo uh huh. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and think, so do you have it? You know, you said you have some trigger keys. Are they you? So you're only changing articulations on the Spitfire patch? Is that no, true? both, both, you're both. And are the key triggers the same for each one? So they're moving together, or are you using how are you handling that? Yes, I I mapped. I I was used to using the contact articulation settings with uh -huh. Steven, so I mapped the Spitfire to to match the same as the contact. Gotcha. Gotcha. And is there ever a time that you want two different articulations or you mentioned that you, you had like using the, the Marcato from the factory ones and then this to fill the sound out. Yeah. I had it set as an initial setting. Gotcha. It would be Marcato on the contact and legato or whatever this is called the smooth, uh, warm. What is it? Vi no, let's see. What is this called? Vivid long. Uh -huh, okay. That's what they call it on London Contemporary Orchestra. So I would have those two. That would be an, an initial setting. And I could never get back to it, but okay. that's okay. But that's okay. You because know, you only thinking. needed it at the beginning. Correct. Okay. Correct. Great. Great. Um, is anybody else who's watching today doing that? Let us know if you're changing your string articulations manually. That's fascinating. Okay, cool. Um, I love that. So this is interesting. I actually had a similar thought with string sounds where it was like needing to have something that has a really good attack you know using two layers is really right. helpful and then is the midi monitor in there just for troubleshooting when you were on the phone with david uh yeah or if i ran into any <laughs> trouble if any you know basically if anything happened on the gig which nothing did yeah yeah but yeah i always i always wanted to have some idea if yeah if there's anything going on i want to know about it Yep. So it's better to have it there and just yep. one double click away, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I love the simplicity of what's going on here. And then for in your variations, are you do you have any preset volumes happening? Like when you're changing between sounds, are you adjusting the the volume ratio? Because you on the front panel of this, it looks like you're mixing the level of each of these with two widgets. Yes. Uh, no, other than I, I had all the I had them set to whatever I, to something that I liked. And okay. then I and then basically just I think the ratios uh, of how they were. Let me go back to the uh, to the front panel. Um, the, the ratios are you could. Ah, oh, they're pretty close, aren't they? They're both about they're eight out. Of, they're both about eight out of ten. So in this particular instance, they're the same ratio. Mm -hmm. So ba basically, I would let the expression pedal do the work, and that was kind of on the fly. And was the expression pedal like uh, mapped to something in Gig Performer, or was that dealing with something different? It was mapped to. Oh, oh, you mean what? I mean these knobs? They were. Yeah. Mapped, uh, what is it? Let's let's see what I did. 
Um, so yeah, channel one, two, vol it was a mixer. I have an audio mixer, and this was mm -hmm. just the map to the volume, and this would be channel three, four volume. Yeah. Okay, so your pedal was controlling widgets. It wasn't like Correct. an external volume pedal. Gotcha. No, no, just con all internal. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. Yeah. Okay, so what what else do you have going on here? I see you have two different pads. What are you using for your pad sounds? I was mostly using this. Let's see, this one is uh, this is just an Omnisphere patch. Okay. So that would be, let's see, let's just load up. Yeah. So what is? <laughs> and then I would hold on. I'm gonna put my mic down. Yeah. little dreamy Nestle yeah. commercial kind of pad yeah is um i turned you down to get um so i didn't you know get the echo in the stream but yeah. did, with um is this literally like a preset you found that you liked and you just popped it in and called it an afternoon or did you alter this at all i might have changed the filter a little bit not much yeah which, which this I, I this gets me so excited because you're you're just using the right tool finding something that works and then getting to the point of what you're doing which is playing music exactly <laughs> which i just i just love it it's so great so you know, this, i didn't have time for anything else right yeah i mean i literally had like a week to prepare uh -huh. to do mm -hmm. everything to learn gig performer again mm -hmm. you know what i mean i yeah. had to do i had to do all uh, to learn all the parts yeah I didn't have time. It was like, if this works, this is exactly what I need. Then there's no need to mess with it. Yep, absolutely. Um, and so was was this patch that you're playing here, the Defying Gravity patch? Yes. Yeah. So did you like have access to what they used for the original sound in that tune? Or were you just familiar with it enough to get close? I was working off a live recording. Okay. And okay. I could barely hear what the keyboards were doing in that section. Sure. But, but, you know, Clifford told me basically, you know, just get a, some kind of a warm pad. So I came up with two warm pads. Okay. And we chose this one. Okay. Oh, so you didn't even use warm pad one. Ended up not using it. Yeah. Cool. I don't think I, cool. oh, I did have it set. I did have it available as I can see, but, but yeah, okay. I, I ended up using it. And then we did a version of uh, I melt with you. The yep. uh, modern English song, and that okay. used essentially the same, same patch. So, okay. very very uh, cool. A couple of instances of Omnisphere in here that I yeah. use. I I relied a lot on the Omnisphere. Yeah. Uh, but also like Repro Five, which I love. Uh, Re Repro Five, you said. Yeah, Repro Five and the Arturia Prophet. I use both okay. Prophet Five emulators. Um, would you have any of those sounds in here? Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, so, you do. They're labeled right there. I missed them. They're labeled, although I don't think so. This one, so he told me to get like the Lyle Mays sound. Okay. The, the, the signature Lyle Mays lead from those Pat Metheny records. Yes. Which, uh, why aren't we hearing it? Because I probably didn't. Yeah, I didn't connect that. I guess I didn't connect it properly. Hold on. This one. <laughs> we've heard that sound. Yes. Uh, uh, so that is, I think that's Repro 5. Yeah. So that's the sound I came up. I programmed that myself mm -hmm. on Repro 5. There's a little pitch envelope there. Okay. Um, and I did the same thing with the Prophet V. Okay. I basically just came up with two versions of the same sound. And what did you end up using and why? Um, I This is the one I ended up using. So, uh, the, the one you're selected on now? Um, this is the with the violin sound. Yeah, wait a minute. Um contact oh yeah i ended up using profit v3 as opposed to repro 5 interesting okay cool and it was just a question of which one sounded better it had to do with the portamento yeah like this kind of sound here um yeah like i think it had to do with what the initial note was so if my initial note was like somehow down there and the first note had to be here it would be like the big loud and, and and Clifford said to me, just just don't start out with a big portamento slide. Yeah. Like, so I think the one. So somehow I had to. Anyway, this one behaved itself better. Okay. Okay. So. 
Um, Very cool. So somebody just asked if you use earbuds when you're playing live. If you're using in ear monitors, I assume. Yes, I use in ears. I have a yeah. uh, Jerry Harvey JH Audio, um, and, which I've been using for years. And so at this point, you just feel comfortable when you're actually when you're making these sounds. Are you working on speakers or are you working on headphones? Oh, I'm working on speakers. Yeah. Do you have speakers that you particularly like, or do you just have speakers you ended up with? Um, I have. I, I I worked on this in two different places in my studio. I have a set of you know focal monitors, mm -hmm. uh, the focal BE sixes. Okay. Which are you know nice studio monitors. Uh, yeah. The su with a subwoofer. Okay. Um, and then you know just working at home in my music room, mm -hmm. I have a couple of Bose computer speakers. Mm -hmm. They're the kind of I forget what they're called, but they're just they're just a set of stereo speakers. They're very heavy for their size. They're like the size of um, are they like those like silver ones that are kind of like pointed slightly up that have like a giant uh, power cable that goes and goes with them like the old school Bose computer speakers. No, these are black uh, okay. and they're they are pointed slightly up. Uh, they're very heavy for their size. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they're about. The size of a large, a fairly, you know, like a medium sized guitar pedal, but okay. twice as thick. I can't remember what they are, but yeah. they're, 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 they're great for what they are. Sure. And, and, and so I have those in my music room and they're just kind of typical computer speakers and, and they're fine for knowing what, and I go to headphones if I need to, but yeah, do you I kind of know what I'm doing. There's like a big, big discrepancy. Like, do you just know your speakers well enough that you know, when you get to the actual live performance, your sounds are going to work? Yeah. Okay. I would yeah. say because also yeah, if I if I hear them coming out of the focals too, I I I, I kind of know what they're going to be. Yeah. You know, um but yeah, I mean as far as yeah, and 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 I did test them out with my Sennheiser headphones mm -hmm. and and my studio headphones, you know, so I, I yeah, I I would say I I kind of know what I'm what I've got. Yeah. And if there's ever an EQ issue, that's, you know, that's not a problem. You know, the, yeah. the Jerry Harvey audio I think it has 16 drivers in it those in-ears okay the ones that i got um i think they're the rock sands if i can remember <laughs> properly anyway they're good they're really nice they're really nice in-ears and so they're, they're pretty good fidelity and no one complained so yeah yeah um david's head just exploded when you said 16 drivers um <laughs> okay so, so you are you're able to kind of mix and you, you get a pretty accurate result, which is good. But probably that just comes from being able to test between your prep and the show, right? Exactly. Like that, yeah. You, you can't learn that unless you are actively w creating on one set of speakers and performing on a different set. Like that's, that's right. the only way you get that skill. That's pretty much the only way you get that skill. Yeah. <laughs> um, David is saying that he's going to get in ear driver in in ears with eighty eight drivers, so he can have one <laughs> driver per <laughs> note. Um, <laughs> That's good. Um, oh, I love it. I'd okay. love to see the crossover circuit. It's, me too. <laughs> um, for for like getting your sounds to all be the same volume, do you just go through and test the volumes, or do you have like a compressor you use, or you know, no, something just like test that. each one. Yep. Something sticks out, change it. That's okay. all it is. Um, and are you like, is that all ears for you, or are you watching the meters and gig performer? Uh, ears first. Okay. If I, if I, uh, sometimes there'll be, it'll just be a question. I mean, mostly it's a question of, does this sound speak in a, as it's supposed to? So it's like, sure. especially like, for example, that Lyle Mays lead sound that I did there. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not in, it's not a hundred percent volume. It's also how bright is the sound? How sharp mm -hmm. an attack does it have? You know, I layered it with some, spitfire violins that gave it a little extra lift mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a volume thing but i would test it out a lot just by playing through the, each song and going all right did that speak the way i wanted it to okay what do i need to do is it just a matter of goosing up the volume or you know what if i doubled it with this or what if i thickened up the sound whatever you know just any number of things to cause it to take up more space you know not just volume mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, I mean, obviously that's one of the things. Obviously, if it's just not loud enough, it's not loud enough. You know. Sure, sure. Well, it's like not loud enough disappears, but when it's too loud, that's a. Well, <laughs> that's, that's really yeah. no good. Yeah, that's really no good. <laughs> and, you know, am I? And the other thing is like it, I, I kind of 
constantly have my left foot on the expression pedal. Uh -huh. And if I find that I'm always bringing it down, bringing the, you know, like instantly, instinctively lowering the, the expression, that I must be set to too high of a level. Right, you know, right. Like if I'm doing that all the time, do I want to do that all the time? Do I, you know, no, I don't. I want to push the button and have it be right. Yeah. So uh, are you I using my myself... hardware for that? What kind of hardware? Follow hardware, the follow hardware feature in Gig Performer. Oh, I know nope. you have, you're not. I'm not. Okay. So you do get a bit of a jump then. Well, I guess you don't get a jump because you set your sounds. I set my sounds and yeah. all of them respond the same. All of them respond to, I mean, I can't show you because yeah. I don't have my Nord here, but yeah, everything does follow the expression pedal. The expression pedal controls all those front panel volume knobs. If we okay. go to the front panel, oops, um, front panel. Here we go. So every one of these, some of them only have one. Some of them have two. Um, some of the synth ones have, there's the mod wheel. Uh -huh. So I can tell where the, I bought, because this gets pretty wild with the vibrato when the mod wheel is on full. And I don't usually want that. I just mm -hmm. give it a tiny little bit of, and then like, I just barely touched my mod wheel and it jumped. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> that's like, that mil that's like, like, like a tiny? <laughs> that's like um like two millimeters above zero it's already halfway up um so i get very i mean i like i really like the nords uh mod wheel okay that's one of my and the and, and the pitch bend is some of my that's my favorite pitch bend and mod wheel setup okay uh, it's one of the that's a, that's one strong reason why i stick with nords as controllers it, I, just happen to really, I just really pitch. like the way they feel okay yeah, there, there's uh, there's some importance to that. What are you using for your mini Moog uh, to to generate that sound? That I believe that was Mini Verse by Cherry Audio, but let me okay. double check on that. Uh, Command T will pop you to the wiring view if you there you go. Shortcut. <laughs> yes, Mini Mini Verse. Yeah, oh, cool. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a little advert for Mini Verse now. Mm -hmm. I really like it. Nice. It's got. Uh -huh. so, I mean, that's not the most representative sound, but. It's yeah. a it's a triangle triangle square patch, uh, but it's I I have a real one that I've a would extensively with it, and I have to say it holds its own. Wow, that's great! Yeah. All right, there we go. Mini verse for Cherry Audio. Uh, yeah. I think this is one of my favorite synthesizers to work with. I use the um, the Arturia Mini V. Oh, that's um, great too. But it it just I guess maybe it's just like the layout of it. But like when I look at that synth, I'm not confused or overwhelmed it's like you get a really good result very quickly and yep. and and a huge range of results too that's um, right yeah which i think is is fantastic something about the the mini moog as a as a classic synth design like mm -hmm. that and and i would say the same about the prophet five mm -hmm. uh it's just like it's amazing the range of good sounds you can get Mm -hmm. Just by looking at and understand exactly what you're doing, the 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 the, the interface is just so, to me, just so uh, transparent. It's mm -hmm. just so intuitive, and and you have such and it covers such a wide range of sounds. It's such mm -hmm. a huge sweet spot. I got you know both synths, uh, mm -hmm. are, you know, or just there's a reason why they're so classic. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for first of all, anybody who's watching, if you have any questions um for andy let us know um david also wrote we have the probabilistic sound designer which is true so if you're trying to get uh kind of like a range of random sounds that are controlled so you don't you know have a sound that's generated with the filter all the way down and you can't hear anything yes <laughs> that, he told me all about that and i i love it i i, I fooled around with it i i didn't have a huge amount of time but i fooled yeah. around with it a little bit and i thought it was great the uh the only other instance uh i have the profit five reissue mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i have a profit 10 actually and i have the oberheim obx8 and an ob6 as well and i have mm -hmm. the software the sound tower software does something like that uh, -huh. uh it was a little bit more it does like genetic it's called program genetics where you can actually kind of breed sounds together mm -hmm. you can pick certain qualities to, to randomize and certain ones to leave alone it's great the probabilistic sound designer is great because you can use it on any plugin right and uh it's that's it's it's something i'm looking forward to delving more into i think it's great i you know years and years and years ago i read an interview with brian eno mm -hmm. where he talked about how synthesizers should be designed this way 
He said, he said, I wish synthesizers could just let you take two sounds or take one sound and just say, give me 10 random variations on this sound. Mm. And then, or breed these two sounds together and see what happens when you get halfway between them or when you just, you know, and th that whole approach to is, is, you know, as opposed to twiddling knobs, what happens if I change the cutoff volume, you know, the cutoff, mm -hmm. the free filter cutoff rather. It's a whole other concept of how to make sound. And it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, and I, anyway, it's like this is Brian Eno's uh, vision come to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. All these years later. Yeah. Well, it is. There is something to be said about <clears throat> like when I'm not uh, thinking about music software and all of that good stuff. There's like, um, you know, I love like note taking applications and all of that stuff. Right. There's a whole movement in that area of like calendars that help you that literally look at what you have to do and tell you when you're most likely to get it done based on your behavior oh wow right so i'm just like like the uh, the uh, the ai i guess of possibility when you have you know intelligent people creating great software actually yields sometimes really really great results um by the way for anyone who's watching there is also a scriptlet which will let you use the probabilistic sound designer on any external synth that supports CC messages. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if that's a value to anyone. Um, it's a value to me. There you go. <laughs> Can it work with NRPNs as well? Uh, David, I don't know. What do you think? He, should, I, should I pull you in? Yeah. Pull David in. Come on. All right, David. It's... <laughs> All right. Let me go back to my yeah. screen. <laughs> Welcome, wanna... David. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi, David. So I didn't actually write the script, but somebody else um, wrote it, and it, and it basically uh, they just created a bunch of parameters in a scriptlet. A scriptlet right. that you write your own. I don't know if you've looked at that, and they just created a bunch of parameters, and each one generates a different CC message. Right. And, and so then those parameters can be attached to the probabilistic sound designer. So there's no reason why one couldn't have um, a bunch of parameters in the scriptlet that generated the 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 N, uh, RPNs, uh, the non-registered parameters as well. There's no reason why you couldn't. I don't know if anybody did that, but there's no reason why you couldn't. So you, so you could have that kind of control as well. I yeah. have a synthesizer that I would love to have probabilistic um, sound design with. Yeah, sorry, it's I, a mouthful. It's I know, but. I, <laughs> um, the uh, the Balaran the river, which yes. uh, you can see, it's the white yes. synth there. I'm it's, a with it. it's a great synth. I love it. Um, it's got very, at least for the Mac. I have a Mac guy. Um, it's got very basic editor librarian features. In fact, mostly just librarian. And I would love to find out what I could do with a little bit of randomness. You know, because uh, well, I, I just sense so much possibilities in that synth. Yeah. So anyway, that'd be great to try that out. If if this could somehow be applied to that, um, yeah, it sounds I, like it can. It might take a little, it take it, a little troubleshooting. I forget who created the scriptless. Um, okay. I, I think it was one of our French colleagues, and that, that which is good, given that the rivers are French synth as far as exactly. I remember. Yeah. Um, so somebody would have to modify it to support uh, the non-registered parameters. I, I bet if we created a okay. forum post, it would happen. Pardon. I bet if we created a forum post for it, it would happen. Yeah, there's it's no, possible. there's nothing technically to stop that from being done. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That'd be cute. For sure. Okay. All right. Thanks, All right. Thanks for hopping in, David. Um, right. Good to see you. So, uh, anybody who's watching has any questions for Andy, let us know. But Andy, I've got a final question for you, which I right. should have told you about, or maybe I did. I don't know. But uh, the same question I ask everybody, if you were going to give one tip to a new gig performer user, what would it be? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm like, I need to send a reminder about that question because it's really uh, it's there's I mean, there's a lot of possibility and also, you know. Uh, I mean, I initially that just triggered a fight or flight response in my brain. <laughs> sure, sure. Right, especially, when in doubt, call David. That's that's <laughs> that's right. That was what I. That was my mantra. Oh, I gotta call David about that. How does that work? <laughs> Honestly, um, uh, you know, one I would say, best thing I could say is, 
start out with what don't don't bite off more than you could chew. Mm. Start out with what you need for the gig. It's gig mm-hmm. performer. It's designed mm-hmm. for a gig, mm-hmm. whatever your gig may be. So start out just how do I accomplish what I need to accomplish and try to stay laser focused on that and then worry about I can add this functionality later. I can do I would love to be able to throw in, you know, I'd love to take my Edina rig and 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 morph it into something that has probabilistic um, sound design that I could use sort of as an extension of my whole studio. I love to to develop it further into something that has more uh, varied uses. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because it's, I just feel like I dipped my toe in the water with this and I did. I learned what I had to learn in a limited time mm-hmm. and it proved itself more than proved itself. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm I'm happy to extend that into other areas. But again, if it's not for a gig, it's when do I have time to do this? OK, do mm-hmm. I have time to throw some, you know, experiment a little bit? Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, you know, as a professional tool, focus on what you have to do. And, mm-hmm. and don't be distracted by the millions of possibilities. But then when you have a little time, check it out. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's I, I can't think. Yeah. Of anything no, that 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 answer or some version of that answer, I feel like has been said, right? Like build it for something. I actually think that was Matt's answer when, when we asked him. It was right. Like, build it for something. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That sounds better than how I said it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's good. It was, this, you know, the same answer. Also, it's like the how you say it actually is is the special part about, you know, why we have multiple pro keyboard players come on. It's, you know, everybody at the end of the day, every pro musician is getting a result that fits the gig. That's the end result. It's like how they get there. That's fascinating. Right. I mean, I, as I said, there's so many, like so many while, you know, way more creative uses of it than what I've done. I, 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 I'd love to get a chance to, to, you know, check it out, check out what other people are doing and see how I can adapt it to what I'm doing. Yeah. But for the now, it's like, you know, this is, as, you know, I have to just be, you know, all business to start out with. You know, mm-hmm. that would be my that would be my best word I could give to people. We got a question from Glenn. Do you have a website or Facebook page? I assume the answer is yes. Yeah, I have a Facebook page. Um, okay. Is that your I, pro I, Facebook I, page? or No, I okay. don't. And, I, you know, I, I, I have to say I have taken a bit of a vacation from social media. Great. In general, yeah. I come on when I've got something I really think a lot of people would benefit from hearing about mm-hmm. me. Um, but no, I, 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 you can check my Facebook page. You can check my Instagram. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't have a website. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't felt the need for one. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I should. I will probably be doing a lot more in that area soon. So keep okay. checking. Andy Burton Music is my handle. And A-N-D-Y-B-U-R-T-O-N Music. So okay. you can check on that in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Glenn, yeah, for your interest. Um, I love it. All right, friends. Well, Andy, thanks for being with us. This was a ton of fun. I hope that oh. everybody watching got value too. Um, but uh, thanks so much for sharing your your time and your thought process with us. Oh yeah, thanks for having me. I, I was it was fun diving into it and thinking about all of it on the air. <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right, friends, we'll be back next week with Kevin Frazier, who's going to be sharing. Uh, generative music and gig performer which will oh, be i can't wait to see that it's, it's it i got to meet with him the other morning this is a bit of a spoiler we're going to end the broadcast here in a second it is a level of music making and a process of music making that is so outside of my element that it's like i only get the surface of it but it's all sequence and it's mm-hmm. note sequence plus cc sequence at the same time wow. being mapped into different. It's like very, very cool. Anyway. So that's, Sounds that's really coming cool. up next week, friends. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, yeah. Until next time. Okay. <laughs>